All right, like we did this morning, we're going to open our Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We'll read here in just a few moments. I didn't, I didn't know you would all automatically stand up like you did this morning. Kind of, kind of left me up here twisting in the wind there for just a second, but we figured it out, didn't we? Uh, so it's such a great honor to be here. We've had a wonderful time here. I was talking to someone uh, before the service tonight, and I just told him it's just a, an easy place to preach. There's a preaching atmosphere, almost an anticipation for the preaching here. And uh, there, are, there are not that many churches like that anymore. And most of the time, they sit there and act as if they've been forced to show up to church. They don't act like it's something, it's a, it's a highlight of their week. Uh, coming to church ought to be one of those things that we can't wait to get around. That's one of the things that happened during this pandemic or whatever you choose to call it. Uh, if I had told anyone in this auditorium in 2018 that in your lifetime it would be illegal to come to church in the United States of America, you would have looked at me and told me I was crazy. And yet they turned around and did that to us, didn't they? Now, people, if you're watching at home and you're on live stream and you still have uh, some other issues and things like that, more power to you. But it's time for God's people to start coming back to church. This, the simple truth of it, we're, we're commanded not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Some things you can't get over live stream. Some things you can't get watching at home. And I understand, please understand, I'm not telling you to risk your life to come to church if you're one of those people and you're taking chemo or something like that and you just are not safe coming. I understand that. Uh, but uh, what most of the people that are staying home, most of them are staying home because it's easier. They're staying home because it's simple to sit at home. You can turn the preacher off if he says something that you disagree with. It's easy to just hit the mute button on your phone. It's easy to sit on your phone and call people and still be logged in. It looks like you listen to the church service. Now, I'm not talking about the people that are actually going to church, actually sitting there right now and watching and getting something out of it. And you, if you truly have the right kind of spirit towards your church, you can't wait to get back. You're sitting there watching at home online saying, boy, I sure wish I could be there. That's all right. The Lord will get you here soon enough. But for the rest of you that are just not coming because COVID gave every single Christian a get out of church free card. It's time to put those away and get back in God's house. All right. Now we're in Luke chapter 11. We'll stand here in just a moment. When you come to church, you expect three things. Every time you come to church, you expect these three things to happen. If you miss one of these three things, you feel like you were cheated by that church service. We expect when we come to church, we expect corporate singing. You stop and think about that. Do you realize standing and singing as a con con congregation is not something you do anyplace else other than church? You don't go to your work and your boss steps up right before you go out on the factory floor and he's telling you about the new OSHA requirements and he says you have to wear steel-toed boots anytime you're on the assembly line and we're only going to pay time and a half for five hours and we're cutting out the rest of the overtime. Everybody, we've gone 47 days without an accident on the assembly line, so let's go out there and have a good day at work. But before we go, let's sing a couple choruses. It doesn't work that way, does it? At a baseball game, you might stand and sing during the seventh inning stretch. If you're at a restaurant and someone has a birthday, you might join along with the wait staff as they sing happy birthday. Other than that, we do not sing corporately anywhere with the house of God. It's almost completely, uniquely associated with church. Amen. We come to church, we sing songs, we sing praise to the Lord. By the way, that's a biblical principle. Hebrews chapter 2, it is Jesus himself standing in the midst of the congregation singing praise to the Lord. Yes, we do sing praise when we come to the church. Amen. We expect singing when we come to the house of God. We expect special music. We expect sing, uh, solos and trios and choir numbers. We expect all of that. If you walked out of any church service this year, you got to the car and you looked at your wife and said, Honey, that was a pretty good church service, but... Nobody sang one single note of any music whatsoever. You would have every right to feel like you were cheated a little bit. We're supposed to be teaching and admonishing one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with melody in your heart as unto the Lord. There's a second thing we expect when we come to church that we ought to expect when we come to church. We ought to expect preaching when we come to church. As we travel, every now and then, you'll run into a church and someone will say something like this. Well, preacher, you should have been here a couple weeks ago. 
Boy, we had such a great service. So and so started testifying, and then this one started testifying, and then this one started testifying. And before you knew it, we testified so long we didn't have time for preaching. Listen, it pleased the Lord through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Isaiah was commanded to cry aloud, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yes, you can have all the testimonies that you want. You can testify for an hour and a half if you want to, as long as you know there's going to be a sermon at the end of it. Amen. I'm not saying that it could never happen. I'm not saying that it never has happened. What I am saying is it doesn't happen nearly as often as people make it sound like it happens. The simple truth is, if you came into a church service any time this year, you had good music, you got to the car, you said, sweetheart, that was a pretty good service, but pastor, no one actually stood up and preached a message. You would have every right to feel cheated by that church service. There's a third thing we expect when we come to church. You expect praying when you come to church. Think about it for just a moment. We've already prayed to open the service. We prayed over the offering. I'll pray when I, after the introduction, after we've read the text. We'll pray before the invitation begins. We'll pray before we're dismissed. When you come to a church service, you expect someone is going to pray. Pray. Uh, what did Je uh, I'm sorry, what did uh, Jesus say? My Father's house is a house of prayer. This is where we ought to come. We ought to expect praying when we come here. You get to your car at the end of a service one night and before this year is out, and you say, boy, sweetheart, that's that music was great, and boy, that preaching was great. But you know what? In that whole church service, nobody ever prayed. You would have every right to feel like you were cheated by that church service. Now, here's something. You know some of this. You might not know it all. This, some of this might be new information for you because most of you are not preachers. But think about this for a moment. When you come to church and you hear the, the, uh, the, the choir sing. Now, you know this. That wasn't the first time the choir ever sang that song. They weren't just learning it as they stood up in front of you. That special that was sung tonight, that solo, that's not the first time he's sung that. It's not the first time. He's probably not the first time he's sung it here. The trio that sang this morning, that's not the first time they sang that. You know what they did? They rehearsed. They practiced. Do you know why musicians practice? So that when they stand up, they, they want you to say, wow, that song was a blessing. They don't want you to say, boy, you've got the greatest voice since that famous opera singer. No, no. They want their song to be a blessing. That's why they do their best. That's why they practice a song that they've done 300 times. They'll still practice it before they do it that 301st time. We've gotten away. My great uncle was a preacher in West, a pastor in West Virginia, and he had one of those churches where you heard it a lot. Someone would stand up and say, y'all pray for us. We ain't practiced much. You don't hear that as often as you used to. Because the singers do their very best to do their very best every time they stand up. They're taking part in a church service. They're bringing honor and glory to God and praising his name so they want to do their best. Do you know, preachers, there are 200 at least books on homiletics that we would consider to be helpful works that will teach us how to preach, how to prepare a message, how to organize a message, how to study for a message, how to deliver a message, how to preach messages and, uh, of topical messages or textual messages or expository messages. There are hundreds of books like that uh, sitting on the shelves of pastors all across our country. Do you realize those books aren't written for the average person sitting in the pew? Those books are written for preachers. Because preachers realize this, the right kind of preachers realize this, that when they stand in a pulpit for those 45 minutes or an hour, an hour and a half, however long they're going to preach, they are literally borrowing Almighty God's authority. They're standing in a pulpit and say, saying, thus saith the Lord. And every preacher that I know worth his salt is constantly trying to be a better preacher than he was last week. We expect the singers to sing. We expect them to try to do their best. We expect the preachers to preach, and we expect them to try to do their best in the power of Almighty God. But when it comes to praying, I think we're pretty much comfortable with where we are. Think about this for a second. We could start right here with Pastor, go back and snake our way this way and that way, and I could ask every single member of this church to stand up and testify about one specific answer to prayer that you've gotten as a result of your own prayer life. And I firmly believe that there's not a Christian in this room that couldn't stand and testify about a specific answer to prayer that you've seen God do. However, 
If I started and went the same way, starting here at the platform, moving all the way back through, if I asked every single one of us tonight, are you completely satisfied with your answers to prayer? Are you completely thrilled with the success, if you will, the power of your prayer life? I don't believe that there is a single person in this room that is so proud and so arrogant that you would stand up and say, yep, I've got the perfect prayer life. Everybody should want to be just like me. I think every one of us would admit that there are holes in our prayer life, that there are prayers that, uh, that we aren't praying, that we ought to pray, prayers that we don't see answered, that we could see answered. I don't think there's a single person in this room that would claim to have the perfect prayer life. It's not that we're unwilling to admit that we need help in our prayer life. It's we're unwilling to ask. As you get to the passage of Scripture here in Luke chapter 11, Jesus is, is praying as the, message, as the passage begins, and one of Jesus' disciples. Have you noticed how many times in the Word of God that you read a story, you read an account that talks about one specific person that is willing to step out when no one else steps out? You realize the movers and shakers of the Word of God, the people that shook the very foundations of our earth in, for the calls of Christ, all were people that were willing to step out while everyone else stayed in their comfort zone. This one disciple decides to ask Jesus a question. He decides to make a request of our Savior. And he asks him this question. He says, I makes this request. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And I want you to know this as we're going to read this here in just a moment. That when this man asks this one simple question, makes this one simple request, that Jesus does not say, well, you go and study and come back to me in about six weeks and I'll see if I can help you. As soon, the instant that this man asks for help in his prayer life, Jesus helps him in his prayer life. The point I'm making is this, Christian. It's not that we won't acknowledge we have shortcomings in our prayer lives. It's just we're not humble enough to ask. Because if we ask, he'll help us every time. Look at Luke chapter 11. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. We're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 13. And the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come, and, has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask a, an egg, shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for the power, the privilege, the potential, possibilities of prayer. Father, we ask that you bless this message tonight. Help us as we look at what you have to say, your son has to say in this passage to us about prayer. Help us, Father, not to sit there with our chest stuck out thinking about how wonderful our prayer life is, but Lord, convict us. May the word of God find fertile soil in the hearts of your people tonight, Lord. And I ask that you bless in a special and mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. As you're finding your seats, please follow this. This disciple is standing there and Jesus is praying. I want you to know that the passage begins first with an exhibition of prayer. Jesus is praying. Now, Jesus did not pray like you and I pray. It's just that simple. I heard one preacher say one time, and I'm sure he was quoting someone else, some of the biggest liars in a church service are people holding a hymnal in their hand. 
How many Christians have stood and sang to the top of their lungs, I surrender all, when they certainly have not surrendered all to the Lord? Amen. How many of us have stood up and sang, Sweet hour of prayer, when in reality, very few Christians know what an hour of prayer really feels like? Most of us would be struggling if we sang sweet 15 minutes of prayer. Now, if we sang sweet three minutes of prayer, we'd be in pretty good shape, wouldn't we? Jesus didn't pray like you and I pray. After he fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, he sent the disciples away. He sent the disciples across Galilee while he sent the multitudes away. And then it says that he went up into a high mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. He prayed for hours. Remember the night before he called the disciples? The Bible tells us that he, uh, that he prayed and cried unto the Lord all night long. The simple truth is Jesus did not pray little three-minute, five-minute, or ten-minute prayers. When he prayed, he prayed for a long time. You can almost picture it as Jesus is there praying. The twelve disciples are standing over looking at their watches. They really didn't have watches. I just threw that in for effect. Actually, they could have been looking at their phones to see what time it is. But they're, they're standing there waiting for Jesus to finish praying. Praying. You can almost hear the mumbling and the grumbling going on and the murmuring. I don't know why he's praying so long. Uh, we've got to be in Capernaum in, in an hour and a half and we're not going to make it if we don't hurry. Oh, and they're waiting for us at the boat dock there so that we can go across the Sea of Galilee. Doesn't he realize that we must needs go through Samaria today? We've got all these places to go and there he is praying. We finished praying a long time ago, but he's still praying. They probably all felt that way, at least at first. But after a while, this one disciple starts doing what the other disciples aren't doing. He's listening. Think about that for just a moment. He is there listening to the second person of the Trinity talk to the first person of the Trinity. He is listening to a conversation between Almighty God and Almighty God. And he starts to listen. And he starts to have this burning desire burning inside of him. He doesn't come to Jesus and say, Lord, I wish you would teach me the intricacies of a, of a powerful prayer life. He doesn't say, Lord, I would like my prayers to be more impressive to people and Pharisees and Sadducees as they hear me. No, he's there listening to Jesus pray and his heart starts beating within him. He's not asking the question, what did John teach his disciples? If he wanted to know what John taught his disciples, all he had to do was ask some of Jesus' disciples, who were John's disciples? Excuse me, what did John teach you about prayer? And he could have gotten that information. He's not saying just, Lord, teach us to pray. He's saying, Lord, teach me to pray like that. I want to pray like you pray. I'm tired of praying the way I pray. If what you're doing is praying, then what I'm doing is not praying. I'm tired of my powerful, my, my powerless prayer life. I want to pray like you pray. Have you ever prayed with someone that while they were praying, it just seemed like they had different access to the Lord than you do? That it seemed as if they reached up with their hands into heaven and grabbed the horns of the altar and shook it as they were praying. You ever had that happen? I remember I was going back for my second year. I'll tell you where it was, and I know I'm in Tennessee, so most of you will be familiar with this. I was going for my second year at Tennessee Temple University. It was 1983. I'd gone in 1981. For those of you who aren't familiar with that ministry that no longer exists, by the way, but uh, that, that, it was a, a, a ministry of Highland Park Baptist Church. They just finished the new auditorium, which they successfully shrunk several times after they finished it, but they just finished the new auditorium. The auditorium from corner to corner, the fan-shaped auditorium, was over 360 feet from corner to corner. Do you know what else is 360 feet? A football field. This auditorium was as large from corner to corner as a football field. There would be anywhere from eight to 10,000 people there every single Sunday. There were 4,108, I believe, chapel numbers that year for Tennessee Temple University. That did not include the high school and the elementary school, and it did not include the seminary or the Bible school is what they called it. So on any given day, there were, there were between four and 11,000 people walking through the campus of Highland Park Baptist Church, all under to the leadership of a man named Lee Robertson. Now, I was there for my second year. I'd gone for my first year, and then I took a year off to go to basic training and AIT with the field artillery, and now I'm back for my second year. In between the first year and the second year, I started dating my pastor's daughter from Sissonville, West Virginia. Now, I was called to be a preacher, 
And so my pastor's wife was okay with me, a 128-pound, freckled-faced preacher boy from the wrong side of the tracks in Charleston, West Virginia. I was from, some of you will know what this means, I lived up a holler. My pastor's wife was a little more hoity-toity, one of those type that kept their pinky up when they drank their tea and things like that. But she was okay with her daughter dating this 128-pound freckled-faced boy from the wrong side of the track because I was called to preach. And quite frankly, in Sissonville, West Virginia, the, the fishing pool of preacher boys was pretty shallow. I was about the only one. But then she went down to Tennessee Temple when I went down for my second year. Immediately, my pastor's wife began to convince her that, yes, there was only one preacher boy in the town of Sissonville, West Virginia, which didn't even have a stoplight. We had a Geno's Pizza, a, a, a Big Star grocery store, and a gas station. That's all that was in Sissonville, West Virginia at the time. It was okay for her to date that 128-pound freckled-faced boy from the wrong side of the tracks while she was in Sissonville. But now she's at Tennessee Temple University where there are thousands of preacher boys. Surely there are some that are smarter, better looking. Surely there are some from the better side of the tracks. And so she began to try to talk my girlfriend into breaking up with me. After a few months of that, every single time she would call her mother, her mother would try to get her to break up with me, would suggest some other boy, would suggest that there were lots of preachers there. It went on and on until finally my girlfriend decided to break up with me on a Friday night. Saturday was terrible. Sunday, I was in the pit of despair. But finally, on Monday, I decided I needed to talk to someone. I needed to talk to a preacher. It's obvious I could not call my home pastor. Here I am at this giant church, and I decided, Pastor, I was going to go talk to Dr. Lee Robertson. I went to his office. I went to my first class. Between my first class and second class, I had an open hour. I went to the office there in the administration building. I walk up, walked up to his secretary, a woman at that time by the name of Dorothy, and I said, Dorothy, I'd like to talk to Dr. Robertson. And she said, about what? And I said, as an 18-year-old boy, my girlfriend broke up with me. Now... I will give her all the credit in the world. She did not smirk. She did not roll her eyes. She did not snicker at all. She just looked at me and she said, okay, and got up from her desk and went back to the office, opened up the large door there, stuck her head in and told Dr. Robertson I was there. Within five minutes, I was sitting in the office of Dr. Robertson, a man with the largest by membership church in the United States of America at the time. Now, I'm going to take a rabbit trail here for just a moment. But as I heard one preacher say, it's my rabbit and it's my gun. I'll hunt it if I want to. <laughs> I know of churches where if you want to go in and see your pastor, you get on a waiting list and you go and see him one month, two months, or three months down the road. I know of people who have lost children and could not get to see their pastor for any kind of counsel or help. I'm sorry, you're not watching for their souls as one that must give an account. You're not taking heed to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. If you don't have the time to help hurting church members, then you need to get a job selling used cars because you're more suited for that than you are the pastorate. Amen. A pastor loves his people. And by the way, you don't have to be in this church very long to know that your pastor loves you guys and you guys love him. And it's a wonderful thing to see as an evangelist. Five minutes later, I'm sitting in the office of Dr. Lee Robertson. He tells me to sit down. I sit down, and he asks me what the problem is. I said, well, my girlfriend broke up with me. Now, this surprised me. I expected him to open up his Bible and turn to a page and say, here's what you're supposed to do. The Bible says, and when thy girlfriend breaketh up with thee, thou shalt therefore verily do. Th he didn't have a verse that said that. He didn't have any advice for me at all. But you know what he said? He said, let's pray. And we got down on our knees right there in his office. And I'm telling you, as I knelt there as an 18-year-old boy and listened to Dr. Robertson pray, I sat there and thought, that's not how I pray. There was more power in that. By the way, I prayed with him several times. The last time was when he was 97. And it was always like that. And I sat there and knelt beside of him, and I knew I was supposed to pray, but I could not just help but sit there listening to him pray and be convicted about my own prayer life. That's a sinful human being. This disciple is listening to the perfect Savior 
talk to his perfect father. Can you imagine the burning in his heart? By the way, I know you're going to want to know the rest of the story. So even though this part has nothing to do with the message, I'm going to tell you. After a couple of months, my girlfriend came back to me. She had told her mother. She said, if I ever get back with him, she said, it's going to be forever. And her mother went along with that because she was so sure there was someone better for her than me. So uh, she came back to me. We got back together. That Saturday, I took her up on Lookout Mountain. I got down on my knees. I opened up a little velvet box that I had purchased months before from a place called Roan Regency Jewelers in downtown Chattanooga. And I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. Sunday night, we came to church. We're there Sunday morning, too, but Sunday night, I told her, come up with me. And we walked up to the platform. The platform was about this high. And I said, let's go up there. I want to talk to Dr. Robertson. No, oh, she says, no, I'm not supposed to go up there. That's the Holy of Holies. Nobody's supposed to go up there. But I convinced her. I'm pulling her up like I'm boating a marlin, right? I'm pulling her up. I finally get her to the top step. We walk up. It's just Dr. Robertson and Dr. Faulkner on the platform. I walked up to Dr. Robertson. I said, Dr. Robertson, do you remember praying with me a couple of weeks ago? And he said, yes, I remember her well, I remember her well, just like that. And I said, let me show you something. I grabbed her left hand and I held it up and there was that diamond ring on her hand. And I promise you, he did this. I'm not exaggerating at all. He said, oh my. <laughs> he said, I didn't know my prayers worked that well. <laughs> but if, it's, if you're convicted when you kneel beside of your pastor and pray, if I'm convicted when I kneel beside of Dr. Robertson and pray, Imagine how this disciple is convicted as he listens to the Savior pray. He's not saying, I certainly would like to have an improved prayer life. He said, Lord, I want to pray like that. Teach me to pray like that. I want to know how you pray. I want my prayer to be as powerful as yours. And by the way, Christian, there is nothing at all to stop us from having a prayer life as powerful as the Son of God. Notice, number one, the exhibition of prayer. Number two, the example of prayer. Jesus immediately responds. Immediately he begins to teach. Immediately he stops. He's finished praying. He says, teach us to pray. He says, all right, right now I'm going to teach you to pray. When you pray, pray this way. And he is going to give us what is commonly known mistakenly as the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you choose to call it the Lord's Prayer, I'm not going to get mad at you. But if you want to read the Lord's Prayer, go to John chapter 17 and read the Lord's Prayer. This is his example of prayer, if you will. This is an outline of prayer that he's going to give them. I go to a church in Cashmere, West Virginia. Every Sunday morning, they have an assembly before they dismiss their Sunday school classes to go to their classes. And the whole church stands there and quotes the model prayer from the book of Matthew. You say, Brother Harper, is that wrong? How could it possibly be wrong for an entire church to stand up and quote six verses of their Bible before they go to Sunday school? Of course it's not wrong, but we don't have memorized prayers as independent Baptists. We kind of roll our eyes a little bit at people who memorize prayers. I say we don't have memorized prayers, but we certainly do, don't we? We have the food prayer. The Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food. We pray that you'll bless it and nourish our bodies. Bless the hands that prepared it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have the offering prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering. We pray that you'll bless the gift and the giver. May the offering be used for the furthest of your gospel around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't that the offering prayer? I'll never forget it. It was the Sunday before Christmas at our church. My father-in-law was the pastor at the time. My brother-in-law now pastors the church. And uh, they're, they're in Sissonville, West Virginia. And it was one of those services where everything went wrong. If you've pastored for 46 years, you've had several services along, the time, along that time that everything went wrong. You just went home and thought, is there one more thing that could have happened that would have been even worse than what we already had? But that's what was going on. We had a, a regular piano player by the name of Debbie Cook. And Debbie Cook is a good congregational piano player. Now, we have been in some churches over the years where they have their first string piano player that's this good and a second string piano player and a third string piano player and a fourth string and a fifth string and a sixth string like that. I was in one church that had 30 people that had nine pianists. That's an overflowing of blessings, isn't it? Now, in our home church, we had Debbie Cook, who was about this good as a piano player. Our second string piano player is a lady by the name of Mary Palla. To this day, our second string piano player is Mary Palla. If Debbie Cook is this good as a piano player, then Mary Palla is... 
this good as a piano player, all right? Now, here's the thing about Mary. I'm not, talk, I'm not telling tools how to, uh, tales out of school. If Mary Powell were sitting right here, she would not disagree with one word that I'm telling you. She knows she's not a very good pianist, but she's different than some Christians because she's willing to step in whenever she's asked. On that Sunday, usually my brother-in-law at that time in the church as the assistant pastor, he led the choir, he led the congregational singing, and he would help when any time the PA system started making those crazy screeching noises that it made. A couple weeks before this, he had fallen off of the platform at the church and shattered his ankle. So he's sitting in the back with his foot in a cast up on a chair during the church service. So we don't have our regular song leader, we've got our second string song leader and our second string pianist. Then we have our third string choir director leading the choir because the second string choir director is also the second string song leader and they didn't want him to do both jobs. And so now, and, and by the way, nobody could figure out anything that was going wrong with the PA. That thing was screeching, the devil was in that thing and it was taking over. It was making all kinds of noises and nobody could fix it. One of those services where everything's going wrong. For instance, the, the, the song leader would get up and say, alright, let's turn to number 67 and everybody would turn to number 67 and stand up and get ready to sing what a day that will be while Mary Pala played on the piano number 68. <laughs> the choir was singing at one point in the service. Everything's going fine. Everybody's looking at the choir and then all of a sudden everything stopped. Everybody in the church turned like this to look toward the piano. All the people in the choir turned with their music to look toward the piano and we all watched in horror as Mary Pala did this. and then started playing again. It was one of those services. Finally, we got back to a semblance of normal scene. My father-in-law called the ushers to come forward. And there they stood, all four of them lined up. And he called on the man standing right here that I've known for 40, 43 years. My wife's known him for, I think, her entire life. A wonderful man. He said, Brother so-and-so, would you please ask the Lord to bless the offering? And I'll never forget in that service where everything had gone so wrong, it was so close to going completely off the rails, what he said. He bowed his head as we all did throughout the congregation and he said this, Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food. We pray that you'll bless it to the nourishment of our bodies. Bless the hands that prepared it. In Jesus' name, amen. Every person in the auditorium is stifling back the laughter. No one wanted to embarrass this man. He's such a nice guy, but he prayed the wrong memorized prayer, didn't he? <laughs> By the way, had he prayed the right memorized prayer, it wouldn't have done any good either, though. Because what does Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13 say? Ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me when ye search for me with all your heart. It's not just some words that we quote. Prayer is as much an attitude as it is the words that come out of our mouths. Notice the example of prayer, how Jesus starts first with praise. <laughs> now, please understand, we've already mentioned it, you certainly praise the Lord with singing. However, if you listen to most people on, in today's world, they would describe the song service as the praise and worship service. Do you know in the New Testament, there's not one time that worship is associated with music. Not one time the word worship is used in association with music in the entire New Testament. Worship is a sacrifice. Now, if you've worked hard and you've practiced and you've prepared to, uh, to, to play in church or to sing in church, you can, in fact, be worshiping. But it's not this eyes closed, hands out, swaying back and forth, repeating the same words over and over and calling that worship. You'll do more worshiping when you put your uh, 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 missions giving in the offering plate than you'll do singing a praise and worship chorus. I guarantee you that. We certainly do praise when we stand up and sing, but praise is not just limited to melody and harmony and instrumentality and corporate singing. Praise happens in our prayer life too, doesn't it? Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, holy be thy name. Let me ask you a question. Is right now, this very moment in time, is God's name holy? Yes or no? Yes. Does it matter how many people blaspheme it? No, it will always be holy. What happens if you and I don't pray, hallowed be thy name? Will it all of a sudden become unholy? How about if we pray a hundred times a day, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name. Are we going to make his name any more holy? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Is his kingdom coming? 
We talked about it as I was telling you about the CDs. That he is coming. He is going to return. Nothing can stop him. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan himself cannot flex his muscle and stop his kingdom from coming. He's going to come back on a white horse with the armies of heaven following, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's what's going to happen. Nothing's going to change it. Nothing's going to slow it down. Nothing's going to change its trajectory. It's going to happen exactly when he wants it to happen. But what if we forget to say thy kingdom come when we pray? Will that stop it? <laughs> of course not. Then he says this, thy will be done. In, uh, as in heaven, so in earth. Is his will going to be done in heaven and in earth? Can anything stop his will from being done in heaven and in earth? Is there anything that anyone can do that will stop his will from being done in heaven and in earth? And the answer, of course, is no. So why would Jesus tell me to begin my prayers by telling my Lord how holy he is and how mighty he is and how powerful he is when he already knows he's holy and mighty and powerful. Nothing can change his holiness, his might, or his power. Why would he tell me to spend the first one-third of my prayer life telling my Lord how holy he is? You want to know why? Because God deserves it. Amen. I'll tell you something, Christian. You'll change your prayer life forever. Nothing at all wrong with having a prayer list. Nothing at all wrong with having a prayer closet. We should have both of those things. But if once a month, once a year, once a week, whenever, you go to your prayer closet, you take the prayer list, you leave it outside. You go inside, you close the door, and you say, Lord, I didn't come in here to ask you for my finances. I didn't come to ask you to bless my family. I didn't come to ask you to guide my future. I didn't come to ask you for one single thing on my list, not to pray for one person in the hospital, not to pray for one person that's doing without. I just came in here, Lord, to spend an hour just telling you how wonderful you are and how glorious you are and how mighty you are and how forgiving you are and how gracious you are and how merciful you are and how compassionate you are. I just came in here to spend a little time thanking you for your grace, thanking you for your salvation, thanking you for making me an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's a mansion prepared for me. Thank you, Lord, for all those things you tell me about. I just came in here not to ask for a thing just to tell you how wonderful you are. Amen. Tell you what, it'll change your prayer life forever once you do that the first time. You'll find yourself doing it more and more. Know this carefully, please. He starts this example of prayer with praise. Not just praise, but then provision. Notice what he says. Not only thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth, and give us on the first day of the month all the bread we're going to need for the entire month. That's what it says, isn't it? doesn't say that at all. See, what we have decided, Christian, is we don't pray about daily bread. That's too small. We, we, I've heard preachers say this. I've heard Christians say this. Well, I only pray about the big things. Can I just take a moment and describe to you how silly that is? Do you know you've never had a prayer request? Let's say you needed, today is Sunday, let's say by Wednesday you needed a quarter of a million dollars and you don't have 25. And you say, Lord, I need a quarter of a million dollars by Wednesday. Do you honestly think Almighty God in heaven goes, whoa, a quarter of a million dollars? Where am I going to come up with that? By the way, the, the foot tapping was pointing out that he's standing there on a street of gold. Now, uh, uh, where am I going to come up with a whole quarter of a million dollars? You know, you've never asked the Lord for anything that taxed his ability, that strained his overflow. You've never asked the Lord to heal somebody that God couldn't heal with the snap of his fingers. You've never had a big prayer request, and neither have I. We look at our prayer request and we say, well, that's pretty big to me. It might be huge to you. It's nothing to him. That's why he says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. The simple truth is we're supposed to pray about everything, even daily bread. Amen. By the way, if you ask the Lord for daily bread today, do you know what you have to do first thing in the morning? You've got to ask him for daily bread tomorrow too, don't you? But do you know what else? We miss this part, don't we? If I ask him for daily bread today, and I have to ask him for daily bread tomorrow. Do you know what else I get to do tomorrow? I get to thank him 
for yesterday's daily bread. See, because we don't pray about it, we're not thankful for it. We've got men in this country that actually will say things like this. Well, I'm the breadwinner. Now, I realize in our society that we need some men that are actually breadwinners and not the government that's the bread hander outer. But understand this. You're not the breadwinner. He's the bread provider. You're supposed to pray about everything. Not just what you think is big and what you think is small. We're supposed to pray about everything. He started this prayer with praise. He went to provision. Then he talks, number three, about purity. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. You know, if your prayer doesn't include this, you've got a problem in your prayer life. Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 59 in verse 2. But your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Isaiah 64 in verse 7. Thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. 1 John chapter 3 says, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. John 9, 31. Now we know that the Lord heareth not sinners. The simple truth of the matter is, Christian, our prayer life needs to have a time when we deal with our own purity, doesn't it? We live for the world and then all of a sudden we need something and we act as if we ring a little bell and God is going to show up like a waiter with a white towel over his arm saying, what can I get you today? That's not how it works. Do you realize in none of scripture that I know of has God ever obligated himself? Now understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying God will not ever answer the prayer of someone who's backslidden. But when he does, it's out of grace and mercy. He's never obligated himself to answer the prayer of someone with unconfessed sin. He has obligated himself to answer the prayer of the obedient and the righteous. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James chapter 5 tells us. Notice, we start with praise, then we go to provision, then we talk about purity, then we talk about protection. <laughs> and lead us not into temptation. There's two things here, and I think sometimes we put the two together, but they're not. There's two things here. This lead us not in temptation. As long as I'm following him, he's going to lead me on that path of righteousness surrounded by the green pastures and the still waters. But when I get away from him, do you know where I find myself? I find myself in thickets. I find myself in thorns. I find myself on the side of a cliff, and all of a sudden I find myself in evil, don't I? He's saying two things. Lead me not in temptation. As long as I'm behind him, he's going to not lead me into temptation. But if I get away from him, then I get stuck in evil. He's still going to deliver me. God is faithful. Who also with the temptation, also making the way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. That which is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. This example of prayer. So, Brother Harper, are those the only four things we're supposed to pray about? No, that's not what he said. He's telling us how to pray. He's helping these disciples to have a more effective prayer life. And he's saying, listen, here's, a, here's an outline for you. Here's some suggestions for you. Here's an example for you. Pray. Start with praise, then pr provision, then purity, and then protection. By the way, Christian, if you're not praying on a daily basis, that'd be four good places to start, wouldn't it? Notice, number one, there's the uh, exhibition of prayer. Number two, the example of prayer. But number three, and we'll be done, the expectancy of prayer. Now, Jesus is going to use some simple illustrations. These are not parables. These are not an earthly story with a spiritual, uh, uh, heavenly interpretation. These are just illustrations that everybody that's listening to Jesus tell this is going to understand what he's saying. He said, which of you? You have a friend. And you have company that shows up. By the way, the second worst kind of company is unannounced company, isn't it? The worst kind of company is unannounced company at midnight. That's not good. But see, I personally believe this man that has to go, there's no Walmart, there's no grocery store, there's no convenience stores. This man has to go from door to door at midnight asking for bread so he can put something in front of his unexpected, unannounced midnight company. I personally believe that this man didn't mind leaving the house. Men, you understand what I'm saying here? Can you imagine what's going on at the house? His wife is saying something like this. 
Well, if you had gone to the store like I told you to, instead of watching that baseball game all afternoon, we would have food to set in front of our company and you wouldn't embarrass me. These people are going to talk to all of their friends and tell them how I didn't give them anything at all to eat and you have embarrassed me in the community. And this man says, I'll go find some bread. And she says, but you'll have to wake people up. It's okay, trust me. <laughs> he goes next door and he knocks on the door and he says, Fred, I need three loaves. I've got company that showed up at midnight and I don't have any bread to set before him. And his friend yells from inside, Hey, I'm in bed. My kids are asleep. The door is locked. Go away. And Jesus says, Well, he will not rise and give him because he's his friend. Yet because of his importunity, He'll rise and give him as many as he needed. Let me illustrate importunity from this passage. Friend, I need three loaves. It's midnight. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I got to watch. I, I, I know it's midnight, but I still need three loaves. I've got unexpected company that came in from out of town. But the door's locked. Pretty sure you have a key. So why don't you come give me three loaves of bread? But I'm in bed. Yeah, that we're back to the midnight thing. I kind of figured you were in bed. I'd like to be in bed too, but I've got company and I don't have any bread. I need three loaves. But my kids are asleep. Not for long. That's what importunity means. Just keep knocking. Never stop knocking. There are only two times in Scripture where we're supposed to stop praying for something. One, when God says no. See, we get that little impetuous, rebellious child attitude. When God says no, we act like he's being mean. Let me ask you a question as moms and dads. When you said no to your children or even grandparents, even though I realize grandparents don't say no very often. <laughs> but when you said no to your children or grandchildren, were you doing it just because you were mean? When your four-year-old son was getting ready to cross the street without looking both ways and you grabbed his hand and you held on and you said to the top of your lungs, No! Were you doing it just because you didn't want him to experience the exhilaration of dodging traffic? Or were you doing it because you love him and you know what's best for him? When your three-year-old reached up to grab the tea kettle that was hot and you swatted her on her hand and said no, were you doing it just because you did not want her to experience third-degree burns and were being mean? Or were you doing it because you love her and know what's best for her? How is it that when we say no as moms and dads and grandparents, we're saying no because we love them and knows what, know what's best for them, but when God says no, he's just being a big bully up in heaven? You stop praying when he says no. That's why the Bible tells us that the apostle Paul besought the Lord thrice that he might redeem from, or remove from him his thorn in the flesh. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And what did Paul say? Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in mine infirmities. That's why it doesn't say that the apostle Paul asked four times or six times or 27 times. When God said no, Paul took the no and went on with life. And by the way, God is more than capable of making sure you know when he says no. By the way, let me warn you about this, though. Sometimes a no is a no from our side, not a no from his. Let me explain what I mean. There's a verse that we talk about all the time when we preach on prayer. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. And it says this, which thou knowest not. You ever scratch your head a little bit and try to figure out how something great and mighty could happen and you wouldn't be able to notice it? See, the which thou knowest not is actually talking about the asking, not the answering. He says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which you didn't even know to ask for. Let me illustrate that quickly. My brother, my little brother, I actually have a contractual obligation that I cannot call him my baby brother. That's kind of demeaning to refer to a 40-plus-year-old man as your baby brother. We walked into a church one time. He was with me, and someone looked at the two of us. I'm 12 years older than he is. Looked at the two of us and asked me, he said, is that your son? So we made a commitment between the two of us. I don't refer to him as my baby brother. He doesn't call me daddy, and we're both happy with that. But my little brother now pastors First Calvary Baptist Church in Hampton, Virginia. Long before he ever got there to that church, I'd been preaching revivals there. And I remember preaching on one night at the, at the end of the service, 
uh, uh, went back to the back and I'm shaking hands and this man walks up to me. He was 82 years of age at the time, a retired brigadier general in the United States Army. That's a one-star general for those of you who don't know. He said, Brother Harper, do you have a minute to pray with me? And I looked at him and I said, well, I certainly do, brother. I said, but would you mind if you're not, if you're in a hurry, we'll go pray right now. If you're not in a hurry, uh, people are waiting in line. I'd like to say goodbye to them first. And he said, oh, that's fine. I'm not in any hurry at all. So I finished shaking a few more hands and I went and found him in the vestibule. And I said, brother, let's go pray. And so we walked through the vestibule up a set of steps to their fellowship hall. Then if you walk all the way through the fellowship hall, there's a door there that says church library. It's a very small room. There's some bookshelves on either side. And then there's just enough place for the two of us to stand. I said to him, I said, brother, what are we praying about? He said, well, he said, four years ago, I had cancer in my kidney and they removed my right kidney. He said, just the other day, they discovered that I have tumors all over my left kidney. I said, yes, sir. And he said, tomorrow morning, I'm going for a scan. They're going to put dye in my body and just see how bad the cancer is in my left kidney. I said, yes, sir. He said, now, when I went through this the first time, the VA hospital must have used a different dye than they use today. Because the old dye never made me sick. The new dye makes me sick to my stomach very badly and makes me very weak. By the way, for those of you in the medical field, it's probably not a change in the dye. It's probably that with one kidney, his body can't filter the dye like it used to. But I'm not going to correct him. Who am I to correct him? And, I, and he said, so here's what I want you to pray about with me. He said, tomorrow when I go in for the scan, I really want the Lord to work it out. So they use the old dye. He said, because I'm afraid, listen to this Christian, I'm afraid that if they use the new dye, it might make me so sick I have to miss tomorrow night's service of the revival. An 82-year-old man with one kidney that's filled with tumors was worried that he might miss a Tuesday night service of a revival. I, I will promise you this. There is not a revival meeting that I have ever preached that I don't have people missing Tuesday night for less reason than that man would have had. We prayed. I remember what I said to this day. I said, dear Lord, the heart of the king is in your hand. If it be your will, the pharmacy can run out of the new dye tonight, and they have to use the old dye tomorrow. If it be your will, the doctor that's doing the procedure will write the prescription for the old dye and not the new dye. Lord, if it be your will, and neither of those things happen, I pray that my brother here will not get sick if they have to use the new dye and he'll feel good and healthy tomorrow night when we come to church. <laughs> we hugged each other's necks and we walked out. I came in the next night at 6.15. I walked in the side door. My trailer was parked out here. As you walk into that church from that side door, on the left-hand side is the men's restroom. The right-hand side is the church nursery. The two walls here are cinder block walls. As I walked in, he was walking out of the men's bathroom. I will not be graphic, but he was walking out after being sick. He'd been sick all day long. His face was almost gray. There was almost no other color in his face except blue around his lips. He walked out after being sick and leaned up against the cinder block wall so it would cool him down a little bit. I looked at him, and I'm going to be, again, transparent. I looked at him, and I got upset with the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't understand. There are people that are going to miss this service tonight. Because they don't want to be here. And this man wants to be here. And now he's standing here sick in front of me. Lord, if the heart of the king is in your hand, why didn't you answer our prayer last night? Immediately, that quick, I was convicted. Who do I think I am questioning almighty God? Immediately, I confessed and as quickly as I could. And after I finished praying in my own heart, I looked at the man. I tried to make it lighthearted. And I said, brother, didn't they use that right guy today? Just like that. And he looked at me and he shook his head no. It was all the strength he had to shake his head no. And then as you look closely at his face, the corners of his blue lips turned up just a little bit. And this is what he said. He said, but they didn't find any cancer either. <laughs> now, wait a second. We didn't pray about that. 
Neither one of us in that church library said, and Lord, make all the doctors wrong. And Lord, make the cancer not be there. Let them find nothing. We were so busy praying about die that we didn't ask for great and mighty things. We didn't have the faith to ask for great and mighty things. He already knew he had a kidney filled with tumors. We didn't have enough faith to ask for that. And the Lord says, listen, call unto me and I will answer thee. You know what God's answer was to my prayer? No! Lord, can they use the right die? No. <laughs> but I'm going to show you great and mighty things that you didn't even ask for. See, when God does great and mighty things, you can't give the credit to a preacher. You can't give the credit to a doctor. You can't give the credit to a lawyer. Only God gets the credit for great and mighty things. So sometimes, even when he says no, maybe you ought to be ready for something great and mighty to happen. Obviously, we stop praying about a topic when God answers yes. Other than that, you just keep praying. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. And the Lord spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. As he tells the story of the unjust judge that won't help the widow lady, and he finally gives her what she wants. Why? He says this, lest by her continual coming she weary me. 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 11, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face continually. Just pray without ceasing, Christian. But what if the Lord says wait? Nowhere in the Bible does it say to stop praying if he says wait. Just keep asking. Just keep seeking. Just keep knocking. Just keep importuning until God answers your prayer with a yes or with a no. Notice he then gives three other illustrations that everybody understands. I think partially one of the problems is as Christians, when we read this, we think it says something than what it actually says. He gives three no-brainer illustrations. Which of you shall have a son? And the son asks him for bread. Now, oftentimes we assume that this is a father who can't meet his son's needs. That's how it's often interpreted, but that's not what he says at all. Your son comes to you and says, Dad, I'd like this loaf of bread and it costs $15. And you say, son, I don't have $15, but I can buy you this $2 loaf of bread. You might even have to say, son, I can't even afford the $2 loaf of bread. I can't get you any bread at all. We all know what we do as parents. If our son or our daughter asks for something that we can't provide, we'll do without, we'll work harder, we'll take overtime, we'll pinch a couple of pennies, and we'll buy them what they want unless it's too extravagant, won't we? We take great pride in that. I know it's a difficult thing to use the word pride from a pulpit and as a positive, but we do take great pride as parents for providing for our children, don't we? That's not what Jesus says. He says he asks for bread, and you give him something that'll hurt him. You ever tried to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on rocks? You might get a little bit more fiber, but it's not going to do a lot of good for your dental work. You understand what I'm saying? He says, your son asks you for bread. You say, well, son, I don't have any bread right now. I can't afford any bread right now. But here, have a rock. Eat this instead. Now, bread was not an expensive commodity, although it did have, there was some expensive bread, but like barley loaves, like the little lad has the five barley loaves. That's the cheapest kind of bread that they had in Israel at the time. You could find bread if you're looking for bread. Jesus isn't saying, which of you is not going to be able to provide your son with everything he wants? It's saying, which of you, when your son asks you for something that is for his good, you're going to give him something that hurts him? And every parent that is listening to Jesus say that is thinking, well, no. I wouldn't give him a rock if he asked for bread. How about if he asked for a fish? Well, son, I don't have a fish, but let's see here. Yes, I have a copperhead. Here, play with this. No parent would do that. Your son might be asking for lobster, and you might say, I can't afford lobster, son, but I can get you some starfish tuna. It tastes good because it's got good taste. <laughs> you might not be able to give them everything that they asked for, but you're not going to give them something that hurts them. How about this? Your son asked you for an egg. Well, son, I can't give you an egg. But look, I've got these two scorpions. And if you stack them up, you can play with them like Legos. That's not what he's saying here. 
He's not saying you're not able to provide what they want because you have limited resources as a parent. He's saying your child asks for something, and instead of giving them what they ask, you're going to purposely give them a stone and a serpent and a scorpion. You're going to purposely try to hurt your children. Every parent listening to Jesus as he speaks, every parent in this auditorium is sitting there thinking, well, no, I would never do that. I remember it was November, the first week of November uh, 2001. My four-year-old daughter came into my office at the house. And we have the one little girl named Charity. And so she came in. She had received uh, an advertisement. She thought it was a catalog. It was an advertisement for a doll company in the mail. Now, for those of you under 30, mail is that thing made out of paper that a guy delivers to a box that you have to walk all the way down your driveway to get to. It doesn't have an E in front of it. It doesn't have emojis on it. There are no GIFs with it or anything like that. It is actual paper. Some of you might have heard your parents talk about that over the last few years. This catalog came in the mail from a famous doll company. It had my daughter, my four-year-old daughter's name on it. She thought that was some, some kind of sign from above that God made sure she had a doll catalog. She was like my wife. When my, back in those days when catalogs were uh, plenteous, you didn't go on Amazon. But my wife would sit down and look at a catalog that she'd gotten in the mail with a pen in her hand, and she would circle a couple of things in that catalog. My daughter had done the same thing, but she had circled every single thing on every page in that catalog. <laughs> every night she slept with it under her pillow. Every night... Finally, that first, one, that first week of November, she walked into my office. She had the little dog-eared catalog uh, advertisement in her hand. She walked behind my desk, and she stood beside of me. Then she gently started moving stuff out of my way on the desk. Then she laid on the desk her little catalog, and then I promise you, she smoothed it out like this. Then she climbed in my lap and put her arm around my neck. Now, please understand, I am a father with a daughter. I've shopped for dolls before. I know how much dolls cost. I'd shopped for dolls at Target and at Walmart and in that day, Kmart. I knew how much the expensive dolls were and I knew how much the cheap dolls were. I'm well versed on that. I know what I'm talking about when she's sitting on my lap. She points to the top uh, top right hand picture on the left page of that catalog and she said daddy I would like that doll for Christmas now I am not the least bit interested in finding out anything about the doll company at that time I don't care if they've been doing business for 700 years. I don't care if their dolls walk and talk and do calculus. It makes no difference at all. I'm a man. I'm looking for one thing and one thing only. Somewhere on that page is a dollar sign. That's all I'm looking for. And I'm here to tell you, I felt like I was on a scavenger hunt trying to find out how much this doll costs. When I finally found it, I thought to myself, how unusual this company uses dollar signs in their stock numbers. The number was huge. I couldn't believe it. It was two or three times what the expensive dolls at Walmart were. I said, Charity, I'm not going to buy you a doll that costs that much money for Christmas. I said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to pick up the phone on my desk and I'm going to call your grandparents. By the way, that was back in the day when the phones were on the wall and the TVs weren't. All right, that's how long ago it was. I said, I'm going to call your grandparents and I'm going to tell them not to buy you a doll that costs that much money for Christmas. She said, thank you, Daddy. She wished me good night. She kissed me on my cheek. She told me she loved me. She slid down off of my lap and she reached over across me and grabbed her little catalog and took it and folded it up and put it under her arm. And she started walking out of my office and she got to the door, I promise you, she got to the door and she did this. She went. <laughs> she walked out to put that catalog under her bed and sleep with it under her pillow one more time. And as she walked out the door, I grabbed the mouse on my computer there on my desktop. I logged on to the website and I ordered that doll. Before she went to sleep, that doll had already been ordered. By the way, every dad in this room knew where this story was going before we even got there. Those little girls know they have us wrapped around their finger. The bad part is that they do know that. When it came in, I wrapped it. Now, I'm not a good rapper musically. And I'm also not a good rapper when it comes to wrapping presents. 
I'm one of those people, and some of you men may agree with me on this. I'm one of those men that believes that if every single square inch of that package is not covered in tape, it will spontaneously open right before Christmas. Anybody else? Every year when I wrap a Christmas present, I get a personal handwritten note from the president of the Scotch Tape Company thanking me for keeping them in business one more year. My wife can wrap seven presents with a piece of tape this long. I can't wrap two presents with a whole roll of tape. It's that bad. I've wrapped it. I put a different name on it. I put it in the back under the Christmas tree. Christmas morning came. We've opened up all our presents. They're everywhere. There's paper and boxes and bows and bells and all that stuff. Charity's had a wonderful Christmas. I don't remember what I got that year. I'm sure I got a wallet. The height of irony is our children buy us wallets for Christmas. <laughs> Finally, I looked at Charity. I said, Charity, did you have a good Christmas? She said, yes. I said, there's one more present for you. It's to you from Daddy. She crawled under the tree, and she found that present. It had a different name on it, and she said, you sure this is for me? And I said, yeah, it's for you. She grabbed it. She started trying to open it. It, it took a long time. There was a lot of tape. She finally got it open enough so she could see the doll's face. And you know what she did? She just dropped it on the floor. She ran across the floor. She jumped in my lap. She wrapped her skinny, little, bony, four-year-old arms around my neck, and she squeezed as hard as she could. And she said, thank you, Daddy. I love you. Merry Christmas. I don't remember one present I got that year for Christmas specifically. But you know what? I'm never going to forget that hug. Why? She asked for bread. All I got her was bread. She asked for fish. I got her a fish. She asked for an egg. I got her an egg. I didn't do anything to hurt her. And you wouldn't do anything to hurt your child either. But then watch what Jesus says next. If your son asks for bread, you know you're going to give him bread. If he asks for an egg, you're going to give him an egg. If he asks for fish, you're going to give him a fish. If ye then, being evil. Listen, Christian, sometimes we forget this. We might be righteous in his sight. We might be justified because of his son's shed blood and we've been attributed the righteousness of God. But that person that you and I look at in the mirror every day is still evil. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. You know how to give bread when they ask for bread. You know how to give fish when they ask for fish. You know how to give an egg when they ask for an egg. If you can meet the needs, if you can answer what they ask for, <laughs> and you're evil, how much more? <laughs> this is talking about, this is the New Testament equivalent to exceedingly abundantly above. Great and mighty things. This is what he's talking about here. Any evil dad can provide what someone asks for. Only a perfect God can provide great and mighty things. If you can provide, what can God do? How much more shall your heavenly Father give to the Holy Spirit to give them that ask him? See, the problem isn't that everyone in this room would acknowledge that your prayer life needs improving. Everyone in this room would acknowledge, I'd like to see more great and mighty things along the way. Everyone in this room would acknowledge, I'd like for my prayer life to be more powerful before the throne of Almighty God. It's not a problem that we're uh, we're unwilling to acknowledge that. Our problem is we're too afraid to ask. This man did not stand there listening to Jesus pray and say, mm, I'd like to pray better. It's convicted my heart hearing him pray, but what if Peter made fun of me for going forward? What if John said something to me? What if the rest of the disciples laugh at me for going forward? You know what happens to us in a church service, Christian? The Lord convicts your heart. He grabs it and squeezes it, telling you how much he loves you by convicting you. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Telling you how much he loves you one more time. And you sit there and think, mm, what if I'm the only one that goes forward? What if I'm the only one that responds to my pastor's message tonight? Listen, if that one disciple had thought that way, this whole story is not in your Bible. One man wasn't worried what anybody else thought. All he knew was he wanted to pray like Jesus prayed, and he wasn't afraid of anybody hearing him ask. Why is it that when the Lord convicts our heart, from the moment that he convicts our heart to the moment the piano begins to play, 
Satan reminds us of how self-centered we are and we listen. It's only one person that wins when a Christian who's convicted does nothing about it. And that's Satan himself. And if you sit there long enough, he'll give you 400 reasons why you should never go to an altar. He'll have you watching for brother so-and-so, whether he goes, or sister so-and-so, whether she goes. This disciple didn't care. We don't even know who he is. But he was so convicted, he had to step out. Lord, teach us to pray. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me tonight, if you will. Just a moment, we'll have an invitation. We have the pianists come. They're going to pick out whatever song that they've chosen for the invitation tonight. And in just a moment or two, I'll give her a signal and she'll begin to play. But I wonder how many Christians tonight would just simply say, Brother Harper, the Lord has me in my seat right now asking him to teach me to pray. Would you slip your hand up, please, and hold it high all over the auditorium, please? Thank you so much. I see your hands. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to step out of your seat. I invite you to do what the Lord's laid on your heart. We'll pray, then we'll stand. After we stand, I'll say a word or two and then give a signal to the pianist. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for how clear it is. Thank you for the teaching that just billows out of it as we read it. Thank you for what you've told us tonight about prayer. How we should be passionate and persistent in our prayer life. Father, I pray that you'll help us tonight. Father, many of your people raised their hand tonight and said that you've convicted their heart. But I pray that you'll help them do what comes next. To do what this one disciple, whose name we do not know, did. Father, have your will and your way in our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, let's stand. All over the auditorium, everyone please standing. No one looking around. In just a moment, the piano is going to begin to play. Once again, if you step out on the first note, you won't give the devil two notes to talk you out of it as she begins to play. Join those that are already coming. Thank you.